Well, hello, this is Pastor Frank from the Balsam Bible Chapel with a message for this Lord's Day that I have entitled, This is My Friend. If you would like to turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter 5, this is a second message, uh, part two, you might say, in the message that I shared last week from a very familiar passage of Scripture, Galatians chapter 5. Um, I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. And while you're turning there, um, I've been thinking about my my preaching and uh, my style of preaching and so forth. And, and I realize um, my preaching is simple. Uh, and sometimes, to be honest, uh, that bothers me a little bit. I know that uh, sometimes people like to be wowed in uh, deep messages with, with deep content. And... Um, in Bible studies during midweek, uh, I do go deeper oftentimes and talk about things that uh, I don't normally talk about in a message on Sunday morning. Uh, for instance, prophecy is something that a lot of people enjoy talking about, and especially in the days in which we live, it's, it's a significant subject. And again, I have dealt with uh, prophecy in Bible studies and given uh, my views on that and how I see scripture and so forth. But um, uh, prophecy, and I'm just using this as an example, prophecy is something that uh, different godly, good and godly people uh, see differently. And so uh, rather than get into things like that on Sunday morning on a message like this, I uh, tend to leave that for more in-depth Bible studies. Um, for instance, the book of Revelation. <laughs> I absolutely love the book of Revelation. I really do. And uh, But there are differing views by good and godly people on the interpretation of Revelation. And it was close to 30 years ago now uh, at a church where I was at. A dear, dear brother in the Lord and I teamed up. And we took the book of Revelation chapter by chapter. In the adult science school class, he led the study on the prophetic aspect of the book. And uh, then during the morning worship service, I dealt with a devotional, the devotional aspect of, the, of that chapter. In uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, there is a promise, a precious promise to us. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And so whatever a person's view is regarding the interpretation of Revelation or whether they know what it, any view at all, there is a promise here, a precious promise of blessing to those who read and those who hear and those who keep the things. And so that's what I look for. That's what I go after is, is that blessing for people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Uh, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, we are warned uh, about the danger of our minds being corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. I love that phrase, the simplicity. That is in Christ. Uh, I'm a simple guy, and, and I know that there are different definitions of simple. You know, some is, <laughs> uh, I hope I'm not that. But I am simple in my, in my preaching, if nothing else. Uh, I just want to simply keep pointing people to Jesus. And the blessing that I get is not hearing people say that they understand uh, my view of prophecy or, or anything like that. My blessing is hearing people say, God is good. Oh, that blesses my heart. God is good. Or to hear them pr in prayer. Grown-ups, grown men, oh, it thrills my heart to hear them saying things like, Lord, we love you. That blesses my heart. And so my goal in preaching can really, I guess, be summed up uh, in one 
of three passages of Scripture. Uh, one, two, or, and or all three. But in Romans 8, 9, the Bible says that for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And so if, I, if my preaching can help people be conformed into the image of Jesus, become more like Jesus, that's what I want. That's what I want. In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so if in my preaching I can help people to do just that, to love the Lord their God, our God, to love them with all that they have and with all that they are, and to love one another. Jesus says that's the first and great commandment, and the second, like it, and on all on these two commandments hang everything. And so if my simple preaching can help people to, to love Jesus, that, that's what I want, and that blesses me. And then the third passage is Colossians 3, 1 and 2, where the Bible says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And so, again, if I can help people to set their mind on things above, and in particular on Christ, that's my goal, that's my desire, that's, my, that, that's what blesses me. Uh, there's a little song that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that's what I want to take place regarding my preaching, is to help people to turn their eyes upon Jesus. Um, I don't want to preach to people's heads, just for head knowledge. Um, that's enjoyable. People like learning, obviously. But my prayer for many years has been, Lord, speak to my heart, that I might from my heart speak to the heart of your people. And so my messages are simple, but that's, that's just the way I am, and that's, that's the way I guess I want it. Well, we come to the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, I began to deal with these two verses last week, but let me pray before I Go further. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the simplicity of your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you that your word is given by inspiration of you and is so profitable. And I pray that your spirit would take your word and do its work in our heart and our minds for your glory and for our blessing. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians 20, uh, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then it goes on to say, against such there is no law. Last week, uh, the message was titled, What Does Your Gauge Say? And I dealt with uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And I mentioned last week that the fruit of the Spirit is more than just a list of, of do's and be's. It's so much more than a list of Okay, I need to do love. I need to show love. I need to be patient. I need to be kind. It's so much more than that. I mentioned about how the fruit of the Spirit shows us God. And the fruit of the Spirit is a gauge to show us how full we are of God. The Bible says in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit. How filled with the Spirit am I? All I need to do is to look at this fruit, and it's a gauge to tell me how filled I am with the Holy Spirit. Uh, this passage, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, shows us God. And I mentioned uh, briefly last week the first uh, five things in this list. Uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or another uh, way of saying that is patience, and kindness. And I gave scripture references to those. And I want to briefly, very briefly, this time look at the remainder of those. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, let me say that a whole series can be preached on each of these. As each of these point us to, to God, 
and are a description of him. Each of these things can have a whole bunch of sermons preached on it. For instance, we can preach a whole bunch of sermons on God's love and God being love and on patience and the kindness of God and all these things. Well, goodness, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. I didn't, I don't think I mentioned this one last week. The fruit of the Spirit is goodness. In Psalm 100, the Bible says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. What a beautiful picture that is. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. And then the last verse of this psalm, verse 5, says, for. So all these things culminates in this verse, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. God is good. This is who God is. This fruit of the Spirit, this is who God is. God is good. So because God is good, I should be good. Why do I even want to be good? Because God is good. And this fruit of the Spirit is a gauge to show me how filled with God am I. Frank, how filled with God's Spirit are you? How good am I? Goodness is one of these of the gauges. And then there's faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. In 2 Timothy 2.13, the Bible says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God is faithful. In Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says regarding the Jews, If some did not believe, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. The faithfulness of God. The old song that uh, great is thy faithfulness, great, says... Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. This is who God is. He's faithful. Why are we to be faithful? Why am I to be faithful to my wife and my kids? If my mom and my dad were still living, why be faithful to them? Why be faithful, period? Because God is faithful. And as I am filled with the fruit of his spirit, then faithfulness will be a part of my life. The next one is gentleness. The fruit of the spirit is gentleness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. The gentleness of Christ. Jesus in Matthew 11 Verses 28 and 29 said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is gentle. That's who he is. That's who God is. And so why are we to be gentle? You know, the Bible says in 2 Timothy, I believe it's uh, chapter 2, that the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. So why, is, why are we to be gentle? Because God is gentle. He is so gentle with us. And uh, since gentleness is part of the fruit of the Spirit, if I am filled with the Spirit, then I'll be gentle. And the last one is self-control. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So many of these go together, like patience and self-control. 
Why can God be so patient with me? Because of his self-control. In Titus chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. That does not point a very nice picture of you or of me. But the Bible goes on and says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And then it goes on. So even when we were, the Bible says, dead in our trespasses and sins, even when we were so unlovely, God showed amazing self-control toward us. Such, such self-control. Jesus in the wilderness, right after his baptism, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, uh, the Bible says that when Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him and said, uh, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's self-control. Jesus was hungry. After all these days, he was hungry. And the devil comes along and says, turn this stone into bread. Take away those hunger pains. Jesus, take them away. And Jesus said, er, no. He said, no. He showed amazing self-control. And he said to the devil, no. No, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. There's more to life than bread. Uh, the, every word of God which proceeds out of the mouth of God. Um, the devil says to you and to me, do this. Do it. I mean, you, you, it'll feel good. You deserve it. And that's the big thing. You deserve it. Uh, it might be wrong, but you deserve it. It's okay this time. Self-control is saying, no. No, devil, I will not do it. The devil says, Give them a piece of your mind. You have a right to be angry and to explode. And we say to the devil, no, I refuse to do that. I refuse to let bitterness flow out of my mouth. That's self-control. Well, why is it so important to see the fruit of the Spirit as pointing to Jesus? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is, it puts our focus on Christ. It puts our focus on Christ. We desire to bear the fruit of the Spirit, not as a checklist. Not so we can say, okay, I showed love today. I can check that off. And yeah, I, I guess I was patient. And, and yeah, self-control. And oh, I was faithful. It's not a list that we can check off. That's not why it's important to see the fruit. No, it's important to desire the fruit of the Spirit because it means we're becoming like Jesus. The more I'm exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, I'm showing I am becoming like Jesus from the inside out. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says that when Jesus had been baptized, he came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open before or open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, and now get what this voice says. And this is the voice of God, the father. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You get that? God the Father says about Jesus, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And according to Romans chapter 8, verse 29, God wants us, He wants you and He wants me to be conformed into the image of His Son. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased, and I want you to, to be like him. There is no greater description given of Jesus than the fruit of the Spirit. In the Old Testament, there is a 
little book called The Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs. I really like that title, but most of the Bibles have it, Song of Solomon. And uh, many today interpret the Song of Solomon as primarily a book of marriage, of, of love between a, a man and his wife. And of course, yes, uh, it does mention that, and it, and it can be applied to that very easily. But the old timers like Spurgeon and Schofield and Hudson Taylor and others, they saw the book of Song of Solomon as a book describing Christ and the church. You know, in the New Testament, the church is referred to as the Bride of Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 5, there is a, a, a passage that talks about the, the wife's response to her husband and the husband's response to his wife. And this beautiful, beautiful relationship between a husband and a wife. And it, it talks about that in Ephesians 5. But then in, as it comes toward the end of that passage about the husband and wife, it says this in verse 32, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. It says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so this whole thing about marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. And so looking at the Song of Solomon like that, we can see Christ and the church, his bride, uh, portrayed there in the Song of Solomon. Anyhow, in, the, that, in that book, Song of Solomon, in chapter 5, verse 9, there are some ladies who say to the, to the bride, they say, What is your beloved more than another beloved, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved? And another way of saying that is, What's so big about your husband? What's so great about your husband? What's so, what's so special about him? Well, in verses 10 through 15 of that chapter, the bride describes her beloved. And in verse 16, she concludes by saying, His mouth is most sweet. And as I look at the Song of Solomon in regard to Christ and the church, to me it's His word. The word of Jesus, the word of God is most sweet. Anyhow, let me read that whole verse. His mouth, or his word, is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. I love that, the way she ends that. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. When thinking about Jesus, when talking about Jesus, people can say, what's so special about Jesus? What's why do you go on and on about Jesus? What's so big about him? What's so special about Jesus? We can go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And we can say, here, here he is. Here is why he's so special. He loves me. The fruit of the Spirit is love. He loves me. He said, greater love has no one than this. And he laid down his life for his friends. And he did that for me. He loves me. He gives me joy. In the midst of a world where there is so much tribulation, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. But in the midst of that world of tribulation, we can know the joy of the Lord. And it is a clean joy, <clears throat> Excuse me, a, a pure joy. We don't wake up the next morning feeling dirty or guilty. No. He is my peace. What's so special about Jesus? Peace. He is my peace with God because of what he did on the cross when he died for my sins. And he gives me peace. Jesus tells me, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This is Jesus. He's patient with me. Oh, he is so patient with me. Because I stumble, I fall, I, I mess up regretfully and shamefully, and I, I, I wish I wouldn't and didn't, and, but he's patient with me. And he's kind to me. 
Jesus is so very kind to me. And he's good to me. Even when I don't deserve it, he's so good to me. And he's faithful. Jesus is faithful. There are times when I regrettably, I'm not faithful. But he remains faithful. Because this is who he is. And he's gentle with me. He's so gentle. A picture that comes to my mind is a big man, a, a strong man, a, a beefy man, a, holding a, a little baby. And my dad was a big man. He was a strong man. After all those many, many years of milking cows by hand, his, his hands were thick, his, his forearms were thick. He was a strong man. But I remember when our first two kids were born. Dad was still alive then, and I remember this big, strong man taking this wee little baby and holding him so gently. We have a God that is so big, a God who spoke the worlds into existence, a God who will in the end speak and Satan will be done away with forever and ever. This God Almighty, this King of kings and Lord of lords, this Lord of hosts, this big, mighty God is so gentle with us. Jesus said in John that he holds us in his hands and he exhibits self-control with me over and over. You wonder what's so special about Jesus? It's because of this. The description of Jesus is right here. Just like in the Song of Solomon, the bride gave this description of her beloved and she says, this is my beloved and this is my friend. Well, here is a description of Jesus. You wonder what's so special about him? Here it is. This is my beloved. And this is my friend. This is why he's so special. And this is why I want to be like him. I want these fruits of the Spirit to be at work in me, growing in me. I want to exhibit these fruits of the Spirit because they are like Jesus. And I want to become conformed more and more into the image of God's dear Son, of whom he said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being so lovely, so good. You are love, you are joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is who you are. Thank you for being our friend. And I pray, Lord, that we would see these things, this fruit of the Spirit, not just as a list of do, but that as we look at it, we would see you, Lord Jesus. And that it would excite us about you. And it would give us the desire down deep in our hearts to be like you. And as we are filled with you and become like you, these things will more and more become evident in our lives. So may that happen, Lord. Help us that this might happen for your glory, for our blessing. And again, for the good of those who, around, who will be around us and see us and interact with us, may they see Jesus Christ in us and through us. I pray in his name. Amen. Lord bless you, brothers and sisters.